Welcome everybody to the most exciting session of the SOSV Climate Tech Summit. I am so excited today to be able to introduce to you Gaurav Chakrabadi, who's the CEO and the co-founder of Soligen, one of my favorite bio companies because of all of this wonderful chemical technology that they have, mixed in with some biotechnology, producing climate neutral, climate negative, sustainable chemicals. Gaurav, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Tell us about Soligen. You've been going great guns lately with fundraising yeah. and building out infrastructure in Houston. Not everybody yeah. who's watching is going to know what Soligen yeah, yeah. makes. So uh, name some of the chemicals that you make. Name some of the products. Yeah, yeah. so we started with a, a molecule called hydrogen peroxide. Uh, then we transition to a molecule called gluconic acid and then glucaric acid. And now we're making uh, base molecules for nylon 6.6 and molecules that are going to go into um, packaging and basically adherent surfaces. So right now we're really focused in on getting the glucaric acid platform scaled up in, into a cash flowing state and getting the next molecule out the door. So our goal is every 18 months we want to launch a new molecule. Um, and so far, we've been pretty good at that. Uh, I hope we can continue doing it. Fantastic. What are the industrial uses of hydrogen peroxide? And then also, what do people use gluconic and glucaric acid for? Yeah, yeah. So it's funny. They all, peroxide, gluconic, glucaric acid, they're all used in largely the same industries. So if you look at uh, in agriculture, in agriculture, you need to disinfect water, right? Because you're going to give them the plants. You need to make sure there's no microbes in it. You use peroxide or peroxide-like molecules to, to kill the bacteria. With gluconic and glucaric acid, that those acids are used to deliver micronutrients in the fertilizer packages into the agricultural crops. There's a lot of companies out there yeah. creating new kinds of microbial-based fertilizers. Yeah. Pivot Bio, like Join Bio. So yeah. you're servicing the traditional fertilizer market. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, when you look at a fertilizer package, it's NPK, right? So sodium, potassium, um, uh, sodium, phosphate, potassium. We're not actually necessarily changing the NPK profile. We are doing something called micronutrient delivery. So there's a, a big volume of like metals, like iron and calcium and things of that nature that also need to be delivered beyond just nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. The problem is the bioavailability of those micronutrients are really hard to get into a plant. So you need something like a glucaric acid, which has a much better bioavailability profile for plants to deliver those nutrients more efficiently. So basically, you're able to, uh, on a mass per mass basis, you're actually getting more of your micronutrient delivered when you have it encapsulated in, in this bio-based molecule. So you're compatible with these new kinds of fertilizer, is that right? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. We, we're totally compatible with it. There's a frame shift that's going on because a lot of people think about synthetic biology companies and they think about giant fermenters and sugar going in and brewing, and, and, yeah. you know, it, the, the equivalent coming out in terms of you might have a brewery spitting out alcohol, but you might have a brewery yeah. now spitting out silk or pharmaceutical ingredients or chemicals or materials. You're different. You're not doing yeah. You're doing cell-free synthetic biology. Your, your power is in the enzymes that you're designing. Is that right? Exactly. You talked about scaling. A big part of that scale requires a lot of capital. Capital. It's known that the chemicals mm -hmm. industry is very capital intensive. There's a lot of sunk yeah. costs in it, a lot of in infrastructure globally. You've raised capital from diverse sources yeah. from, from early stage 50 years, the VC here in San Francisco, right through to BlackRock in terms of pension funds yeah. and, and large amounts of capital. Tell us about the capital that you've raised so far, and then tell us what's on yeah. the roadmap for Solugen over the, over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, so capital we've raised so far, we've raised about uh, nearly $780 million in equity capital. Um, like you said, it started off with really focused VCs, but then it's kind of, as we've been scaling our technology and co customer base and commercial, uh, that that capital has started to look like institutional funds. So like you said, like really, you know, traditional, almost private equity like uh, players in this space, which is good. That means this stuff works because the 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 rigor that private equity and these institutional guys are putting into diligence, they would not touch a company like Solugen unless it was de-risked substantially. And so that's where we are right now. Where we're going, we've now hit the point where we can start getting debt capital for our assets. And so when you look at where we're going next, the D Department of Energy's loan program office is a really big one for us. Um, 
uh, I can't say here like all the timing on it, but there will be some announcement at some point soon on Solution and the DOE LPO. These are big loans. Um, these are up to a billion dollar loans at very low interest rates. It's the one that Tesla got that made their first Gigafactory the Gigafactory. And so in a similar vein, we believe that the DOE LPO is what's going to allow us to now break out even from private equity and, uh, and go into the debt side of the story. Yeah. Fantastic. We were both in Washington, D.C. at the White House about 12 months ago for the launch of the Biden-Harris administration's executive order on the bioeconomy and biomanufacturing. Can you talk a little bit about that executive order and what in it was most exciting to you about support for the bioeconomy? Yeah, so I think there's like two ways that I look at um, the executive order. One is um, philosophically, what is it telling? And then two is what is practically, where is the teeth in this thing? So on the philosophically, what is it communicating? The thing I got most excited by was one of the bold goals was to replace 30% of the United States chemical demand with domestically biomanufactured alternatives. Um, that's a big number, <laughs> a really, really big number, right? Uh, and so for, for us, that was huge because now all of a sudden, biomanufacturing is being put on the same playing field as Petrochem, which has never been the case. So philosophically, that's really helped us kind of get the story out there, not just to government folks, but also to customers. When customers saw this EO, they were like, oh, Solution, you're around, this is great. We're gonna have to buy from you. So we might as well be friends. And the second bucket was basically focused on, okay, where's the teeth in this thing? And that's, I think, we're all still trying to figure out is where is the big teeth in this system? What we're realizing is it's all super interconnected. It's not just the bioeconomy EO sits by itself. It's interacting with every single department uh, in, the, in the government, the DOD, the DOE, uh, the agriculture department. Everyone is part of this EO. So what we've been doing is talking to the, uh, the leaders across these departments to understand how they plan to appropriate funds. Uh, the DOD has already put out some uh, guidelines on their fund announcement. I think it was $1.2 billion, but that's just the DOD. There's many more that are going to come. So I think we're about to see some pretty big moves in the next year uh, on this stuff. I invited Jiga Shaw from the Department of Energy. I know he's a big deal in terms of these loan guarantee programs. Yeah. I invited him to speak at Symbi Beta last year. He couldn't come, but uh, there was a profile of him in the Wall Street Journal recently just talking about the scale of these infrastructure yeah. loans that the DOE is putting out. It's quite fantastic to see the, 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 the government yeah. putting its weight behind some of these programs to what I see as balancing the, the infrastructure investment that oil and gas have had this for the last you know, 50 <laughs> years yeah. or more, and finally bio is getting a, a crack at the whip. And in terms of the yeah. progress that you've seen from the folks in the White House and in the government over the last 12 months um, executing on this executive order, are you happy with the progress that you've seen? I think we could be doing better. I, I think we've we've had these discussions. Things are things are moving in the way we want them. The problem, I think, is the real bottlenecks aren't being communicated properly. So, like, I'll give you one example. There's an assumption that the bottleneck is all in R and D, right? Oh, we got to throw more money at R and D. Great, let's do it. Let's see what happens. What ends up happening is you have a bottleneck in the labor side. So when, when you start talking about, hey, I want to scale up a biomanufacturing facility, it's not the R&D scientists that are scaling it up. It's, it's the people who are building these things. So where the bioeconomy today has been focused is a lot on this front end. But the reality is the, the bottleneck, at least as we see it, is here. And we need to be funding more vocational schools, more community colleges to, to teach biomanufacturing as, as a skill set. And all of a sudden, your supply and demand start to get matched up uh, much better. That's where I think there's a big gap. I think yeah. there's a big opportunity. The farm bill comes up for renewal once every five years. It's going to be renewed, should be in, in, in the next 12 months or so. There's a big opportunity here to really envision a bio belt across the entire country. Where we exactly. See a lot of these yes. rural communities taking their commodity feedstock Precisely. like corn and soy yeah. and being able to turn them into higher value exactly. materials. And, and we have to train, right? Like we have to invest a lot of money in education and training that workforce because it's not just the PhDs that are going to be making this thing possible. What's been really nice is we've been able to convert, I guess you'd say, a lot of the folks who have been in the traditional petrochem industry into looking at biomanufacturing. And there's brilliant people. I mean, think about it this way. The petrochem complex has spent a trillion dollars on this headcount over the lifetime of, of this industry. This is a very skilled labor set that if you can convert them into a biomanufacturing mindset, you have some of the best engineers in the world working on climate. 
the rich countries we do have to lead, and you can look sector by sector, you know, solar, now the interconnect limitation, the transmission limitation. So we created a nonprofit group that's about the grid, um, implementing the IRA very quickly. So we created a nonprofit group that we fund uh, called Investing in Our Future. Mm -hmm. It's just to accelerate those things. In every area of emission, in every policy, we need more philanthropic dollars. We need more smart people. We need more consumers willing to buy green products. So there's nothing, you know, we're not on a path to get to, you know, a 1.5 degree limitation. Climate, uh, it's changing the entire industrial base. Uh, and, you know, so it's an extremely hard thing to do. Innovation gives you a chance of doing it. And what I've seen in the innovation space, uh, you know, that I committed to create breakthrough in 2015, it's gone far better uh, than I would have expected, even in very tough areas like steel, cement, agriculture, hydrogen. What we're seeing is very promising, mm -hmm. but not at a level where you'd say, oh, this, you know, move on from this. That's, you know, why, uh, you know, we built this incredible team. We partner with governments and philanthropists, and you know, it's got many pieces. It's got fellows, venture, policies, open source grid models, and we've started up a dozen philanthropic organizations that are to accelerate these things. It's, yeah. you know, it's a serious effort.